When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put the ways of childhood behind me, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And from Proverbs, the simple believe anything, but the prudent give thoughts to their steps. When Jesus was at Bethany, visiting the house of Simon, who had a skin disease, a woman came to him with a vase made of alabaster containing very expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' head while he was sitting at dinner. Now when the disciples saw it, they were angry and said, Why this waste? This perfume could have been sold for a lot of money and given to the poor. But Jesus knew what they were thinking. He said, Why do you make trouble for the woman? She's done a good thing for me. You always have the poor with you, but you won't always have me. By pouring this perfume over my body, she's prepared me to be buried. I tell you the truth that wherever in the whole world this good news is announced, what she's done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me if I turn Jesus over to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that time on, he was looking for an opportunity to turn him in. Ah. Ah. Sigh with me. Ah. Doesn't it feel good? Are you ready? Yeah. No, are you ready? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> there's some hard, challenging words today, so are you ready? Yeah. All right. Jesus was at the house of Simon, who had a skin disease. What benefit was there in that for Jesus? Jesus, anointed with expensive perfume by a woman. What benefit was there in that for Jesus? Both of these relationships had the potential to create trouble for Jesus, right? I mean, they really did. Being in touch with someone who had a skin disease would make Jesus ritually unclean. Then he would be an outcast. Being anointed like this, and by a woman, well, you heard what happened, and you know the story. It made even his own disciples mad, and it pushed Judas right over the edge. And those Pharisees were just looking for something. So what benefit was there in it? for Jesus. What defined these relationships? Was it love? Or were they friends with benefits? Hmm. Now some of you saw the sermon title advertised, Love or Friends with Benefits. And I will say that more than one of you came to me a little nervous. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's about your own personal past. <laughs> Just kidding. Or if you were worried about what I was going to say. What do I mean with this? Because the words, that phrase, uh, friends with benefits, in our culture usually means sex with no strings. Right? A couple of friends who agree to be sexually intimate with each other and have no expectations. They can get together and have sex so there's no sleepover, no breakfast. <laughs> No, you know, they're like, she's saying this. I am. Basically, friends with benefits, which goes on a lot in our culture. Come on, get our heads out of the sand, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is, an, is a, basically an expectation of a certain specified, named, agreed upon benefit, 
without any other expectations, without any other commitments to anything more than that which was agreed upon. Are you with me? It's a mutual using. I believe that we don't have to think about it just in terms of sex because I think friends with benefits goes on a lot in our world today. That people have mutual using relationships. Mm. So you don't have to think about it in terms of sex if that's disturbing to you. However, the contrast between having sex and making love also goes to the point of today's sermon. Let me ask you, are you in love with God? Are you in love with Jesus? Are you in love with spirit? Or are you merely interested in being spiritual friends with benefits? Hmm. In other words, are you most interested in what the divine can do for you? Mm. Is your spiritual relationship with God and the one with your neighbor based on what you get out of it? Let me just ask that again. Is your relationship with God and your relationships with your neighbors based on what you get out of it? Or is it based on love? Deep, passionate love of God. Deep, passionate love of neighbor. In terms of the divine, let me ask this in another way, in case you're still uncomfortable with the friends with benefits piece. Let me ask you, are you a fan or a follower of Jesus? I like him. I'm interested in what he has to say. I'm interested in if he can heal me. Are you a fan or a follower? And while we're asking these hard and pointed questions here to get you thinking, even if you have more of a friends with benefits approach to your spiritual relationship, I want to ask you, just what are you contributing to the relationship? Ooh, I just tread on some toes then. Is it what the divine can do for you, or is there some mutuality even? Have a look at this. If you're out there, send a sign. Something simple, like have this lottery ticket I bought win. Or maybe that girl Sue falls in love with me. Or I find a pile of cash or something. Please, something simple like that to let me know you are there. Doesn't that grasp a friends with benefits mindset? Hmm. Think about the thief on the cross next to Jesus. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us too. Prove to me that you're the Christ by taking care of yourself and then take care of me. That's about what's in it for me. Right? Do this for me, Jesus. It's a common prayer, isn't it? A common cry, a common relationship characteristic of many people. It's a relationship with Jesus. There's bargaining. If you do this for me, then I will fill in the blank. What? I'll go to church more often. If you would just heal so-and-so, I will go to church more often. If you will just help us get out of debt, I'll give more to the church. If you will just, do you hear it? It's very much like the temptations in the wilderness, is it not? When the devil said, do this and I will give you. Oh, treading on some more toes. Because when we play in that role, we often start playing the same role as the devil in the wilderness, and we're tempting God to do something for us with a weak promise to deliver something that's not even ours to deliver. Yeah? Why is it we want to test God's love all the time? Maybe the real question is we test love. We don't even trust love. Well, this sermon series through Lent... I've been using a resource from a book by uh, Erwin Raphael McManus. And in it, pertinent to today's sermon, he says, One day, to my surprise, 
Beth, a congregant of his, came to me and began sharing openly about her life before she met Christ. She explained she used to live with this guy, and she had just talked to him and decided to go back to him. Have you heard that story before? Yeah. Her motivations to turn back to her old life were surely more complex than what she explained. But all she told me was that she didn't feel God anymore. Her conclusion was that God simply didn't love her. Sometimes it's easier to believe in a love you can touch than a love that is real. Wow. Wow. And as I was thinking on this sermon, uh, songs kept coming to my mind, you know, and that's dangerous. So, why do fools fall in love? Nobody else sang with me. Oh, well. Frankie Lyman. Recorded, too, by the four freshmen and Diana Ross and a host of others. Why do fools fall in love? Some of you really like the second line. Why do birds sing so gay? And lovers await the break of day. Why do they fall in love? Yes, fools fall in love. But here's the bridge of that song that many of us know. Love is a losing game. Love can be a shame. I know of a fool you see, for that fool is me. Tell me why, why, why? Uh Uh-oh. You see, some of us learned that falling in love is foolish. We learned it from pop songs, even pop theology. We may have learned it from observing failed relationships with parents, siblings, friends, or even our own failed relationships. And one thing is for sure, we do not want to look like fools. Amen? We don't like to look like fools. So if there's a chance it's going to make me look foolish, then I'm going to guard my heart and not fall in love, right? There are lots and lots of scriptures, I want to assure you, in uh, the Bible that talk about that negative side of being foolish and talking about the fools make these bad decisions. And There's a lot about construction. Houses on sand, remember that? Okay, and being fools, okay. But there is a remarkable exception. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, the text is on the screen. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know God, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. How about you? But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Mm. There's a case to be made for being a fool in love. And God seems to understand that people would view falling in love with God as foolishness. So speaks right to that and says, okay, they're going to look at it as foolishness, but I'm telling you, it's the strength. It's wiser than the wise, stronger than the strong. You see, in the ancient world, not all relationships were about love. I know you're shocked. Most were business arrangements with benefits for the two parties, and not usually the women. (laughs) They are more usually for the man and the woman's father or family, usually the father. Relationships were formed for political alliances, for financial reasons, business benefit, for production of children for a labor force, or to inherit the family business, and yes, for sexual gratification. But much more so for the economic reasons, whether that was a human resource or a financial resource. So I'm going to ask you, 
I mean, that's the ancient world, and hopefully we've evolved some, but do you long for an arrangement or for love? Do you want an arrangement with God? A deal? I'll do these things, and then you're going to get me into heaven, right? Isn't that how a lot of people approach it? Or are you interested in love? Is falling in love foolishness? Is falling in love, falling in love with God foolish? See, I'm talking about passionate love with God. And then if you fall in love with God, really fall in love with God, do you really care what other people think? Don't we do enough things in our world worrying about what somebody else thinks about it? To the Jews, a stumbling block. To the Greeks, foolishness. Who cares? The more your identity is rooted in God's value for you, the less you are controlled and limited by what others think of you. If only fools fall in love and people who are in love act like fools, then those who are changed by God's love really do become fools for Christ. You know, it's not in my notes, but there's a, it reminds me so much of that story of my own childhood when we were at camp. And I went to music camps and Bible camps as a kid. And when we were at Bible camps, we always had to name ourselves something and have a scripture verse that named our cabin, our group of, in our cabin. And, uh, you know, one year we were the doers of the word. And we, we were, you know, action-oriented. And we did little projects and things action-oriented. And then, um, one year that I'll never forget, that we were fools for Christ. And then we were talking about, and we did clowning. That was our big thing. But we were fools for Christ. And we took that text on with pride and with joy to say other people may think it's really silly that we would spend a week of our summer vacation at Bible camp and other people would think that we're silly having so much fun in God's presence. Let them think what they think. We were having a ball. You understand? See, the world might see those of us who let ourselves passionately love God. They might see us as fools. And sadly, they may see other Christian relationships as friends with benefits. Some people have those momentary experiences of feeling something that they might call love, but they're not really sure about it. And spiritually speaking, it may be those moments when you experience a spiritual high. And you're like, wow! And you have this feeling, and you want to try and live in that feeling, but then you come off the mountaintop, and it's like... (sighs) And you want to get back to that feeling. It's all feeling-based, yes? And it's, it's almost like being in love, which is another song. There's this song by Ariana Grande. It's called Almost is Never Enough. She writes, almost, almost is never enough. So close to being in love. If I would have known that you wanted me the way I wanted you, then maybe we wouldn't be two worlds apart. But right here, in each other's arms. But we almost, we almost knew what love was. But almost is never enough. Beloved, don't let this be your song. No regrets. No saying, if I'd only known. And I'm not talking about human relationships. I am talking about your relationship with the divine. Have no regrets that you held back in that relationship. That you almost let yourself really love. Rather, declare your love for God. Express your love for God. God already has. God already has declared love for you and expresses love for you. What's holding you back? Love involves you. Love makes a commitment. Amen? And God has made that commitment to you. Can you make that commitment to God? Friends with benefits may like each other. They may even care about each other, but not to the level of those who care deeply about the other, who are in it not for what they get. Amen? 
Although there's lots of benefits to being in love, amen? But they're in it because they cannot help but be in it. Because they love the other almost with abandon. There's no heart commitment in friends with benefits. But in that commitment that we make to another when we say, I love you and I give you my all, it's not giving myself away, but I open all of who I am to all of who you are, and I receive all of you who you are. Yes? And I desire to know all of you. And with another human being, you commit to continue to get to know the other, not just the part you fell in love with. Right? But we commit to go deeper. I believe that God desires that with you and I, that God desires a heart commitment and that God desires to be in a passionate, passionate, loving relationship with you. McManus, as we've been sharing over these last few weeks, talks about a contrast of um, a barbarian relationship or a barbarian Christianity as in a wild and unleashed experience of the spirit versus a civilized and domesticated and controlled kind of Christianity, all right? So he says, the barbarian call, this wild, unleashed experience of spirit, confronts us with all we love and all we fear. We resist love to avoid pain and squelch our dreams out of fear of failure. For the Spirit of God to unleash dreams and visions within our souls, we must become free to risk and to fail. Every dream born of God is fueled by love. Every conversation to be had with God challenges the boundaries of our imagination. When we turn to God, God's love transforms us and ignites a new passion within us. All that we have loved is consumed by the passions of a new heart. We discover the power and force of love in its purest form. Even a childhood fable understands this truth. E.B. White in Charlotte's Web. When Fern sings to Wilbur, I used to think the sum of one and one was two. But we add up to more, me and you. When we are close together, it is plain to see. Together we are better than we used to be. I don't know how to say the things I'm thinking of, but the something more I'm feeling must be love. I used to think the sum of one and one was two, but we add up to more, me and you. That's the creation of we. You and I create something new, an experience of we, and that's God and you as well. It's God in you. Human beings created by a relational God, created in relationship with God and one another and with the rest of creation. And when we get really into that relation, it creates that we. We're created for relationship. Are we created merely for benefits? Even mutual benefits? I think not. We're created in love, by love, and for love, which comes in many forms and in many relationships, and that love creates something new when we share it with the earth, with neighbors, in intimacy, and with the divine. Jesus was with Simon, who had a skin disease, because he loved him. Jesus received and embraced the anointing with precious oil because it was a gift of love, and he loved the giver. It looked foolish to the disciples, especially Judas. And there was a cost to his loving, but love was greater. Jesus was crucified, not in spite of his love, but because of it. 
Somehow love incites both love and hate with equal force. And the mission of Christ would be so easy to embrace and carry out if love always resulted in love. But it does not. It seems the world insists that love be proved. So then those who claim love are required to endure hate's most brutal tests. Jesus endured many of those tests, and we're coming to Holy Week when we walk those tests with him. But before we get there, most churches today are reading the story in John 11 of the raising of Lazarus. And I want to just touch on this story. There's a man named Lazarus, right? He was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, according to John's gospel, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with his hair, her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now when he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Do you hear it? It doesn't say he was concerned for them. It says he loved them. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. What? Wait, what, what? <laughs> You'd think that if he loved him, he'd go take care of this problem, don't you? But he stayed where he was. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. And then the disciples, but rabbi, but, 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 a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, yet you're going back? What's going on for the disciples there? Love for Jesus? Or are they concerned about what's in it for them? Hmm. I think personal fear, personal safety, has nothing to do with love for Jesus, doesn't even have anything to do with love for Lazarus. They're not even worried about Mary or Martha or Lazarus, are they? They're not saying, let's go quickly to Bethany. Well, the story goes on, and Jesus teaches them a little bit more, and then he tries to explain that, metaphorically, that Lazarus is asleep. They get all confused with all this, and then we still get to this sort of benefits thing when Jesus is trying to explain it to them. Then Thomas suddenly pipes up and says, well, then let's all go so we can die with him. Well, so suddenly then Thomas wants to go because he's got a benefit, a potential benefit, you hear me? Verse 20, when Martha heard, because now they finally do go. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. As I read this today in the context of this sermon, I hear love and trust. I don't hear her telling Jesus what to do. I don't hear her telling Jesus what she needs. She's affirming who Jesus is. I, he wasn't here when her brother died. That's the facts. But God will do whatever Jesus asks. Now, she doesn't know what Jesus may ask. I hear love and trust. And then we have the teaching about um, I am the resurrection and the life. And then they tell Mary that the teacher's here. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. They just believe somehow Jesus' presence would have changed things. Jesus' presence would have changed things. Jesus' presence would have changed things. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Than the verse most of you learned in Sunday school, Jesus wept. We could spend a lot of time with that verse. Why did he weep? Why? Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. When someone dies who you love deeply, you grieve, do you not? The depth of Jesus' love is evident. The scripture taught us that he loved Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. We know he went to their house a lot. 
then verse 37. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? What were those people interested in? Benefits. Not love. Jesus goes on with teaching and talking to them and tells them to take the stone away. And there's the discussion about how long he'd been in the grave and all of that. And they calls Lazarus out. Calls him to come forth and take the grave clothes off. And at verse 45, Therefore, many of the Jews who'd come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. From the evidence. Love was proved. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told. I have to read the rest of the verse. Told them what Jesus had done. But doesn't it sound like they went to the Pharisees and told? Hmm. Love and sacrifice cannot be separated, people. This is perhaps why so many of us who know love fear love. Jesus loved Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, and he met them in the midst of their grief. Yes, he raised Lazarus from the dead for love not only of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, but love of the disciples, love of those who are observing, to show them and show them what was going to happen even for him and for others, for us. But it was a risk because those same people who were waiting for Judas to be pushed over the edge at an anointing with expensive oil. We're just waiting for him to go too far. And sometimes people see love as foolishness, and sometimes they see it as threat. Jesus took the risk to go to Bethany out of love. Out of love. It looked foolish to the disciples. It seemed foolish that Jesus didn't go as soon as he heard he was sick, that he waited till he died. It seemed foolish to observers that Jesus didn't simply prevent Lazarus' death. But Jesus risked it all for love. For love of them, of the disciples, and of us. If we are to be like Jesus, we must always risk for love. We are invited to follow Jesus with reckless abandon. The call of God is more than a leap of faith. It is a life of faith. So we hear that scripture once again that tells us, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. Let go of asking too, what's in it for me? In other words, stop trying to form spiritual friends with benefits. Make a heart commitment with the divine. Take the risk to love, really love Really love God and spend the kind of time with God that love requires to form the we, to embrace God's family as you fall in love with God. Open yourself up today to falling in love with God. God is waiting for you to passionately fall in love. God already passionately loves you. Take some time to think about it. Confess the ways in which you've just looked at what God can do for you. And open yourself to the transforming power of love.